Before I introduce our speaker today, I would just like to make a quick disclaimer that uh, the information on this webinar is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So please consult with your uh, physician if you have any questions. And with a uh, next slide. And without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker uh, for uh, this month. This month's workshop is Dr. Alvin Chang. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chang graduated from UCLA Medical School, and he is um, a geriatric medicine as well as an internal uh, medicine specialist. And uh, he often participates in uh, the city domestic medical outreach events to help those who are uh, uninsured as well as underinsured. Um, and without further ado, let us uh, welcome our speaker for uh, this month. Uh, Good morning. Uh, thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, Ting Yao. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today's topic is on uh, dementia. I want to share with you the uh, prevention strategies and early treatment and management strategies for dementia. Next slide. So first of all, we got to talk about you know normal uh, short-term memory loss from uh, aging versus real dementia. So with aging, we all lose some uh, memory function, but you know it's usually a normal aging process is gradual. And I'll share with you uh, on a side-by-side uh, -side comparison a little later versus dementia, which is related to some kind of disease in the brain or other organs causing cognitive changes. Um, and so it's uh, it's much more obvious and it's progressive. It doesn't stop. Um, so that's a, that's the two main things because I get these questions a lot. Oh, doctor, uh, I can't remember things. Am I having dementia? And that's a lot of people's fear, I think. So next slide, please. Symptoms of normal aging. Let's go over it in more details. So if you forget people's name that you know well, uh, that's okay. Um, if you forget about what you're saying in mid-conversation sometimes, we lose our train of thoughts. That's also normal. That's nothing to be concerned about. And also, this happens to me too. Um, when you try to get, when I try to get something in the next room, and I walk to the room and I forgot what I was going to get, and I have to step back and think about it, and then you know I remember. So that's okay too. Those are very common. I'm sure a lot of people uh, experience that on a regular basis. And then also, it's very common finding things I just put down. So a lot of time I was looking for my glasses, like, and I'm looking around. Where did I put my glasses? And then my family will point out, hey, what's on your, on your uh, hair? What's on your head? And I touch it, it's my glasses. So it's very common. And then the last thing is, you know, when you're trying to say something, a particular word, you get stuck and you can't remember that word. You know what you mean, but it just stuck at the tip of your tongue and doesn't come out. So those are all very common uh, memory loss symptoms of, uh, due to normal aging. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is dementia, uh, symptoms uh, of medical conditions, dementia causing uh, these below symptoms and they're, you know, very, very obvious. So if you forget important details of the things you've done in the past few weeks, important stuff, uh, or are you forgetting things you say you would do, important stuff, not just something you mentioned in passing, something you promised somebody you're gonna do or something, and you're forgetting them, um, like you forget to your appointment, like an important doctor's appointment or some kind of other appointment, you totally forgot. And, you know, sometimes that can be uh, significant. Forgetting recent event or conversation. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, when you're under a lot of stress or anything, just normal day to day, you're forgetting a lot of things and people start noticing it. And then, this, I get we get this a lot uh, in uh, older patients. Uh, their family was telling them are telling us that they're saying the same jokes to the same person uh, or same events uh, over and over. 
I mean, it's like the 10th time you hear it, grandpa said this or grandma said this, you know, that's something significant. And the other thing is complete, uh, completing complex taxes at home or work, balancing checkbooks, planning projects, and these are high functioning. So if somebody start to have a problem with doing these kind of stuff, uh, that's very significant too. Um, usually something is going on. In Asian culture, a lot of times, you know, uh, the families, family member help compensate, help the the elderly, um, f you know, do a lot of the checkbooks, uh, do a lot of things for the for the elderly in their homes. So these may not be so obvious. But if somebody who's living by themselves and start having problem with uh, balancing checkbooks and uh, planning projects or things like that, that's usually a sign of dementia uh, or underlying medical conditions. Next slide, please. So MC, let's summarize, MCI versus dementia. Um, oh, hold on, we gotta look at the healthy aging checklist, healthy check, uh, brain checklist. Can we show that? Uh, yeah, so can we scroll down? So. This is just summarize what I just you know mentioned. Symptoms of medical con. Uh, we can scroll up a little bit. I'm sorry, to show the symptoms of uh, medical conditions versus symptoms of normal aging. So you know uh, we'll have this uh, on the Suji website to share with you guys uh, if you request them. You can give it to your loved ones uh, to check out the list and see which side you're on or this person is on. You know, um, so. A lot of normal symptoms of normal aging uh, is mistaken. So hopefully this will help. Okay, we can go back to the slide. So MCI versus dementia. MCI is an abbreviation for mild cognitive impairment, and this is this could be the first symptoms of dementia. It's a precursor. So in this stage, it takes about seven years. And usually the patient does not have uh, much symptoms at all. Very, very, very mild symptoms, no, not noticeable. A lot of time they're, they might be still working uh, or you know, early in retirement or half retire. Um, so this is very important because it's so long. We uh, hope to do a lot of intervention and pre prevention in this stage. And next stage is dementia. And dementia had three major um, category, major stages. So mild, moderate, and severe. Takes another seven years before a patient usually uh, passes on. Um, so a lot of time, unfortunately, we see uh, most of our patient in the mild to moderate stages because by this time, symptoms uh, are significant and you know, causing problems. That's why family uh, bring them to our clinic to be uh, examined and to get treatment. Uh, next slide. Okay, the prevalence of dementia in the U.S. in 2020. So, you know, between age 70 and 71 to 79, there's about 5% of all people uh, have, that have dementia. But by the time we get to age 90, it's close to 40%. And the thing, the problem is uh, everybody, you know, we have a lot more people who are uh, living longer and longer. So more and more people will be in age 90 and over. Uh, it's becoming more common. So uh, we have to do something because it's getting, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And in people with dementia, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's dementia, accounts for 60 to 80 percent of the cases. Um, that's why a lot of time you hear people use Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably. They say, oh, if somebody has Alzheimer's, that means they have dementia and vice versa. It's because Alzheimer's account for the majority of dementia cases. But there are other types of causes such as cardiovascular. So by that we mean somebody has strokes, uh, little strokes or big strokes, and that can account for five to ten percent of the cases. And the next one is called Lewy body. <coughs> Excuse me, Lewy body is 
not very common as you can see it's only five percent but it's made famous by robin william famous comedian who committed suicide because he learned that he had louis body dementia and he couldn't st uh, stand the uh, the thought of this progression of symptoms that's why he committed suicide because people who have louis body dementia have a lot of severe symptoms like hallucinations depression and they have parkinson like symptoms so they get really weak um and it's just not very good so uh, even though louis body is very uh has very small percentage but you know we see them and it's easy to spot uh because of the severity of symptoms and um, also very very poor prognosis and then others type of dementia uh, accounts for the remaining five percent of total cases uh, the major ones are like frontal temporal dementia and these are people who are very disinhibited will say things start yelling at people cussing all those kind of things but their memory is uh, fluctuates it's not typical of like alzheimer's patient you see who are slower in terms of uh all the memory function and speech and everything so these accounts for uh the dementia cases in the u.s next slide please so let's go over the definition of dementia okay so in order to have dementia someone has to have two or more difficulty in areas below that we'll talk about and also affect a person uh, to function in daily life. Um, I mean, if somebody's well compensated, somebody's take, uh, is being taken care of, they may not have difficulty function, but we can notice these areas. Uh, so first one is remember what was recently learned. We kind of mentioned that earlier. So because a short memory problem, a person cannot learn much of any recent things, recent events, what they just ate, uh, any new phone number, anything, anything that has involved short-term memory, they'll have problems. And the next one is recognize name, objects, such as people and familiar things. So if somebody's getting lost around their house, they've been living in, in for a long time, that, that's a very big sign also. Um, also speak sentences that are understandable to others. I mean, if they are, if the person has dementia, uh, that's pretty significant. They cannot, a lot of time they cannot make uh, complete sentences or comprehensible sentences. It's just rambling. I mean, you'll see that a lot in patients with moderate to severe dementia. But one thing we have to be uh, careful is that if somebody has bad um, hearing problems, uh, not, they're not wearing hearing aid, they may not answer questions appropriately. It may seem, you know, totally off topic. And that's something we have to watch out for. And that's not dementia. That's just hearing problems, hearing loss. Next one is making decision or judgment about things that are personally important. So um, if somebody's making these weird uh, decision that's not characteristic to their past history or making poor judgments, that's not consistent with their past. Uh, we gotta be, you know, watch out on this. Uh, so this happens a, a lot when somebody's living by themselves. So um, that's one area also. And then the last one is planning, organizing and executing simple and complex tax tasks. So again, somebody cannot balance their tax books uh, or uh, checkbooks or, um, doing other things, planning on projects or other things, uh, that's a sign. And usually they're either working, still working, or they're living by themselves. And the problem will show up very early. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, I showed you guys the, we showed you guys the brain, uh, healthy brain checklist. So now let's look at the, uh, functional assessment, uh, staging test. Um, so this, this is about, you know, uh, how long each stage of dementia takes. So if we could scroll up so we can see, uh, yeah, the table. And when I gave this speech, uh, speech before, a lot of families and people found this table very useful because they give, this gives them uh, like a guide, a roadmap of 
what to expect. Um, so, so you see normal aging, it's, you know, no deficit at all, and then possible mild cognitive impairment. Um, there's no symptoms either. And then when you get to my, uh, when you get to mild cognitive impairment, so it says expected untreated duration. So it's 84 months. So it's about seven years. So there's some mild, you know, impairment, um, but usually it's not so obvious and patients usually able to stay at home. So we got to do a lot of work at this stage. So prevent if I'm going further, like next stage you'll see is mild dementia. So IADO is intermediate ADO functions like uh, uh, laundry, like uh, calling on the telephone, uh, paying bills, cleaning, things like that. So usually people stay in the mild dementia for 24 months, two years, and then they move on to moderate dementia. So by this time you start getting into more and more problems. Start having problem dressing, uh, putting on clothing, bathing, toileting, um, and then be eventually becoming continent. So, you know, you can see like these months, the stages they're in. And then when you get to mo a severe dementia, that's really bad. They can only, they usually need to have full-time caregivers or stay in the assisted living or nursing homes. And it just, and it just keep getting worse. And usually they cause a lot of uh, problems for the families because they, a lot of times they don't sleep uh, and they need a lot of care. They need somebody to watch them 24-7 uh, so they don't wander out of the house or something. So it's very bad. So from mild to severe dementia, it takes about seven years. And these seven years usually are very, very um, taxing for the families because of the amount of care and effort need to be put in and you know, it just one person is just not enough. Okay, so we'll try. Uh, we'll go back to the slides now. Okay, so next slide, please. Yeah. So, how do we diagnose dementia? I mean, I just we just went over the the symptoms and everything. They have two out of the five, six criterias. Uh, they it's possible they have dementia, um, but dementia as of now, is a diagnosis of exclusion. So that means we have to eliminate all the other possibilities first because we can, before we can say patient has dementia. So we usually rule out vitamin deficiencies like vitamin B12 deficiency, it's very common, especially in vegetarians uh, that don't eat any eggs or any other thing, just strict veg uh, vegan. So um, a lot of vegans will supplement vitamin B12 because they don't get enough vitamin B12 from the food source. Um, and it's correctable. Uh, we, a lot of time we give patients vitamin B12 injections uh, once a month for a couple of months. And, you know, they improve their overall symptom improve. They have more energy and short-term memory seem to improve a little bit if they have a vitamin B12 deficiency. And the other one is uh, rule out depression. Depression symptom can present like dementia and depression is treatable. So let's take a look at geriatric depression scale. So um, you kind of have some idea. Uh, we use this in our uh, clinic uh, to do screening. Medicare uh, uh, asks for um, primary care provider to do uh, annual uh, depression screening. And so we give this to patients and they can uh, fill it out or the family can fill it out for them. And then there's a score. Uh, and then based on the score, we can see a patient has mild, I mean, no de depression, mild or uh, moderate severe depression. Severe depression is pretty obvious, but mild depression is sometimes hard to spot. Okay, uh, just uh, to give you an idea. Uh, we go back to the slides, please. Okay, so we rule out depression. Next one is rule out hypothyroidism. Thyroid problem is very common in older people. Uh, it's very subtle, it's not very obvious, but low thyroid hormone in your body causes you to slow down, your brain function to slow down, your speech to slow down, you gain weight and get con very constipated. Uh, these are common symptoms. So we check patient thyroid function annually to make sure we don't miss hypothyroidism. And hypothyroidism is very treatable. We just have to give appropriate dose of thyroid hormone. It's a medication 
and we can restore the function thyroid function to normal. And then the last item is, I mentioned that before, hearing loss. Hearing loss is very common. Um, a lot of patient, a lot of older patients, they don't want to wear hearing aid because they have, uh, it's, they say they can't hear very well. It's just very loud and sometimes it causes imbalance because uh, if the hearing aid is not functioning properly, patient get dizzy because of the imbalance of the volume between uh, the hearing aid in each ear. So we have to rule out hearing loss. Um, I, can, I can't tell you how many times I hear, see families bringing patient, uh, saying that they have, they think this patient has dementia. And what we found, found out was patient really has hearing loss, hearing problems. Uh, once hearing is corrected, um, they can answer a lot of the questions and conversation more appropriately and they don't seem, they don't really have dementia. Okay, uh, next slide, please, and uh, next slide. So uh, part of elimination, uh, the diagnosis of exclusion is we also do a brain CAT scan or brain MRI to rule out strokes. So stroke, uh, there is such a thing called small strokes or lacuna infarct. So it's not stroke in the big in a sense that somebody has a stroke and they can't move their arms or legs or talking or have speech problems. These are tiny little strokes that happen and does, doesn't cause any major problems no obvious symptoms, but over the years they develop, somebody has many, many little strokes, uh, eventually adds up to a big area and they can, and they start to affect their function. And that's what accounts for five to 10% of the dementia cases. And we call them vascular dementia or multi-infarct dementia. Um, if we see that on the CAT scan, that could explain why this patient has all the problems you know, with short-term memories. And the other thing is, Unfortunately, just because a person has vascular dementia does not mean they won't have Alzheimer's. So people can have both. So we have seen people have both. Um, and that's a terrible thing because that makes a dementia much worse and progress much faster. But uh, vascular dementia is preventable uh, if we control the blood pressure and the blood sugar. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And next thing uh, is called PET scan. So I know some of you heard, heard about PET scan um, for cancer, for staging cancer. Um, but in this, in this uh, case, we use PET scan to, to look for amyloid plaque uh, in the brain. So amyloid plaque is, is a, a protein deposit. It's like the scarring tissue of the brain cells. If, when brain cells dies, it, they form amyloid plaques. So when there are a lot of amyloid plaques, uh, we see that patient usually have pretty bad dementia, but we still don't know what caused the amyloid plaque in the first place. And also on the PET scan, we can see Alzheimer's patient has decreased glucose metabolism. So our brain uses blood sugar as a fuel. But when somebody, when somebody has Alzheimer's disease, their brain cannot utilize the blood sugar as well. And we see that decrease in PET scan. And that gives us a, a hint of somebody may have Alzheimer's versus the uh, vascular dementia or other type of dementia. And now we have a uh, thing, uh, biomarkers from uh, spinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, tau protein and these other things that we look for. And usually when they have these biomarkers, it's likely that they have Alzheimer's. But we cannot say that for sure. Maybe in five years, we'll have a definitive diagnosis from these uh, biomarkers. As of right now, we don't have it yet. They're just suggestive, suggestive of somebody has Alzheimer's. And the final thing is uh, we do this, you know, when somebody has memory problems, uh, we do uh, memory tests, screening tests called, uh, the first one's called an MSC, mini mental state exam. And I'm sure you heard about this. So the doctor usually, or the nurses usually start asking, what's today's date? Where are you at? Uh, what are the three things I'm going to give you three things to remember and, and then ask you to, uh, you know, uh, mention it again after about five minutes or something. So these are mini mental state exam. It's used very commonly uh, all over the world. Uh, it's okay. It's, it's pretty obvious. By the time patients have problem on the MMSE, they usually have mild to moderate dementia. Um, but the next one is called MCI screening test. If we can show the website, uh, 
the it's it, this is a very very good test. And the reason I mentioned that is because MCI screening is used to is used by insurance companies that sell long term care insurance. So you know usually people buy start buying long term care insurance in the 30s and 40s to uh, you know make sure they uh, they get taken care of when they're older. So long term care insurance pay for somebody who stays in assisted living or nursing homes um, later on in life. Um, but when insurance company, what they want to do, is they want to make sure you, a person does not have uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, or anything. Uh, so they use this MCI screening test to screen. It's so sensitive. It can pick up somebody who has a tendency for uh, Alzheimer's uh, when they have no symptoms at all. And it's developed by um, a professor at UCI. Uh, and what I found out was when my parents were buying long-term care insurance and they had to take a telephone test and they told me about the test and they were describing the questions and it's very striking that it's almost the questions are identical to the one I use for the MCI screening for my clinic patient when they come in for memory problems. And I went and asked the inventor of the test, I go, how come in, uh, insurance companies using the test very similar to yours. And the professor told me it's because they bought it from him. They bought his, they use the test because it's so accurate, it can pick up a patient without any symptoms, obvious symptoms of dementia, but it'll show up on the test. And you can sign up um, uh, to do this test uh, at, you know, uh, we have like in Orange County, it's a Hoke Hospital. They have a, they have a place to do this kind of test or you can go online, this website and check it out and look for physicians that administer this test. Uh, we know that a lot of children of uh, patients with Alzheimer's, they are very, you know, afraid. Uh, logically, of course, they're afraid that they might get the same thing as their parents. So they want to take this test to see where they're at. So it's a very excellent test. I encourage everybody to look into that if there's a need. And go back to the slides, please. So next slides. So, you know, with the MCI, with the MCI screening test, um, it allows us to detect somebody who has tendencies of Alzheimer's, right? So we want to uh, do that to um, find somebody first, and then we can start treatment early. But let's talk about what's the, some of the prevention strategies. So what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Just remember that because the the heart and brain use a most of the blood, our blood flow from our body, they're big organs, heart, you know, very important. If our heart have problems, uh, we're going to have problems everywhere. But also brain uses a lot of blood flow. So, you know, we do a lot of things to help our heart, like lowering the cholesterol, control our blood sugars and everything. Um, and we exercise to help our uh, train our heart. The, the same thing you do for your heart is good for your brain also. So diet, we got to reduce inflammation. So I don't know if everybody is familiar with the concept. Aging, aging process is a form of inflammation. So the more inflammation you have, the faster the aging process. So uh, we're doing everything now. You know, you hear on TV and that in the magazines and everybody talking about reducing inflammation, slow down aging process. It's all for this. So we take a lot of fish oil right? Fish oil decreases inflammation and help with the heart. Uh, it's, it's excellent. And it also uh, thins the blood. Also, fish oil has a lot of excellent uses. Um, so we use that to help our heart and also help with our brain also. And then the other thing is I learned from my medical school years uh, through a professor in neurology. He said we should, if we eat a lot of red meat, we should drink a lot of tea, like dark tea, like um, not green tea, but like the regular tea, um, because the tea, the tannin oil in the tea binds the iron. So what happens when we have too much iron in our body, it deposits in the brain and can contribute to the formation of dementia. I think this is, not many people know about this, but it makes sense. So uh, make sure you drink some tea um, when you eat a lot of, when you eat red meat or something. Um, because a lot of iron, a lot of scientists postulate that iron 
too much iron can cause inflammation in the body. Um, and the next one is turmeric. A lot of people have heard about turmeric, right? Turmeric is a yellow, uh, like it's come in a yellow form, a yellow powder. It's a main ingredient in curry. And the reason this came about was when scientists analyzed Indian in India, the population as a whole, they found out they have the lowest incidence of dementia uh, in their whole population. So among different countries, India has the lowest per, per population for like 100,000 people, lowest incidence of dementia. And they think it's from the curry, uh, from the turmeric and the curry that decreased inflammation overall uh, and, and causes have less uh, incidence of dementia. So now we're taking, everybody's taking turmeric to try to reduce inflammation. And that's the reason. Next one is controlling blood pressure and blood sugar. We mentioned that earlier. If you have high blood pressure all the time over the years, you're gonna get stroke and eventually get dementia. Uh, blood sugar is another story. Blood sugar has to do with diabetes, right? When our blood sugar is high, uh, over, over time it weakens the blood vessels, can cause stroke, can cause um, other problems, can cause uh, inflammation. High blood sugar can cause inflammation. And high blood sugar stimulates insulin secretion in our body. And insulin secretion, high insulin is very bad. Uh, high insulin, insulin is, is the growth factor. So when somebody has very poorly controlled sugar and their body makes a lot of insulin, also stimulates uh, tumor, cancer growth, because uh, it's a growth factor. It stimulates all blood cells, I mean, all cells. So we got to watch out for that. We got to control blood sugar and blood pressure. And then I know everybody knows about exercising, right? Walking, weightlifting, hiking, yoga. And it's very important because increase the blood flow and soften the our arteries and blood vessels. Next one is brain exercises. It's very important. Uh, we have, you know, we should try new things, not stay with the old routine because you're, you know, just like your muscle, you keep doing the same thing and muscle doesn't grow. It's used to the routine. So I have to change it up and you know, learn to play a mu mu uh, musical, new musical instrument, a uh, new language, go back to school to take classes, doing meditation and prayers. All these are geared towards helping the brain. Very important. Brain is like muscle. The more you stimulate it, you use it, the more it grows, even in somebody with dementia. So it's very passive. So please remember to, to exercise our brain in different ways. Uh, next one is very, very important. Uh, insomnia. So, you know, we know a lot of people when they get older, they have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep and take all kinds of sleeping pills. And I'm sure some of you read that you know, a lot of these sleeping pills help contribute to dementia because sleeping pill, the, the sleep, sleeping pill induced is not the right kind of sleep. Um, we need real sleep, real deep sleep to um, reorganize our memories and everything to keep the brain healthy. So when somebody doesn't have enough sleep or taking all kinds of sleeping pill for many years, they're more likely to get dementia. Uh, the last one is maintain social activities. Human beings are passive. Uh, are, I mean, are, you know, group animals, social animals. So we have to have, be around people um, to prevent isolation. Um, because, you know, like everybody heard of solitary confinement in the jail. After they lock somebody up by themselves for a couple of months, they're not the same when they come out. It's because of deprivation of social interactions. The brain shuts down, everything shuts down because there's no stimulation. So we got to make sure, especially in the age of pandemic, even though we cannot go out, we want to maintain social activities through online activities and things like that. Okay, next slide. Um, I mentioned before, treatment, um, early diagnosis and early treatment delay the progression of dementia. So if we can keep somebody stay at the MCI, mild cognitive impairment stage, that's seven years. That's a long time. So they stay, usually they stay in this stage for seven years, but what if we catch them with the MCI screening test in the very beginning and we start treatment? I mean, it's long, it's gonna be longer than seven years because the normal course is already seven. If we catch it and delay it by a couple more years, it could be 10, 11, 12, 14 years, who knows? Um, so 
so medication, there are like two different uh, main treatment strategies. One is pharmaceutical, so medications. The other one is non-pharmaceutical, supplements, social intervention, and the next slide, we'll see that. Next slide, please. So I'm sure everybody heard of, you know, Aricet, uh, so it's Don, Donetazil, Donetazil, it's Aricet. Galantamine, rivastigmine, there's a patch. I don't know if people have heard of that. And then there's another medicine called Nemenda, Mementine. So a lot of doctors, you know, when you go to take a loved one to the doctor's office saying that uh, this love, your loved one has memory problem, a lot of times the family doctor will give you Donetazil, Donetazil, so Aricet. Oh, they'll say, oh, you, I'll just help the memory. And then that's it. But the problem is uh, these medication by themselves, one or the other, um, they only help for about a year. They don't really help that much. But there's a landmark study, oh, it's over 15 years ago, that shows a combination of Danetazil, galantamine or rivastigmine patch, along with Nemenda, combination. These two combinations, Danezapril class ver, uh, plus Nemenda combination can delay the progression of dementia for up to seven years. So think about it. If we catch somebody at the very beginning of the MCI uh, stage with the MCI screening test, and then we start these medication, and then we can delay the progression for seven years on top of the seven years of the natural progression of the MCI. That's 14 years. That's 14 years. Think about it. So in 14 years, a lot of things can happen. And that's what happened in my patient population. We do that. We use this treatment strategies and we have patients who stay in their home, careful by their loved ones for up to 10 years. And they didn't get worse. They stay the same. Um, and, and this saves a lot of money and effort because if they don't get worse, you don't have to deal with, um, you know, the incontinence, the not sleeping. The, the feeding, the toileting, the bathing, all those things. So think about that. It's so important. So that's why we encourage everybody um, to get early diagnosed, to get early diagnosis is because of this reason. And a lot of time, uh, the, the patients, they have other medical problems like heart disease or cancer or other things. And some of them died uh, not of dementia. They died of other diseases because we do so well with the uh, dementia treatment and that's okay you know and that's fine um, I, I want to mention two other medication one is called Aduham. that's the medication everybody hear about on tv that uh, recently approved by fda that's a monoclonal antibody and that was used to bind the amyloid plaque somehow they show that the study shows that by binding a lot of amyloid plaque those patients' symptom of memory loss seem to improve some, but it's very controversial. That's why you, you don't see many people doing that because it's an intravenous injection and it costs fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. So I would advise a lot of my patients and families to wait and hold off to see what's happening because it's so new. You still you don't want to be guinea pigs. Um, so that's where. And then, then there are also nasal insulin spray. It's like the insulin we use for diabetes. Uh, we found that some studies found that if you use this insulin um, to spray in the nose, it may help with memory. And that goes with diabetes and sugar use in the brain. Uh, but it's not, it's still experimental. I just want to mention that so somebody, you have some idea, but it's not approved by FDA at all. So main thing is the combination of medications, Donetazil and Amenda combination helps a lot at any stage. So this is what I use in my clinic to treat my patients. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So non-pharmaceutical uh, treatment. Uh, first one's called MCT oil. I'm sure some of you heard of it because it's used a lot in keto diet. So MCT oil means medium chain triglyceride. And a lot of it, uh, this is derived from coconut oil but do not take coconut oil because coconut oil by itself is, is not good uh, for your health. It's too, um, it can cause a lot of cholesterol problems and you know, you wanna take MCT oil derived from coconut oil. 
And what they found was 10, maybe 10 years ago, this was a kind of a medication, a, a farm school company made this because they found that brain not only uses blood sugar, but it, could, it can also use fatty acid uh, as a fuel. So when we're starving, when we're starving, we don't have enough food to eat. Our brain can switch to breaking down our fat in our body, making fatty acid, and our brain can use it as a fuel. So that because this pathway is not damaged in Alzheimer's, uh, we scientists found out they can use MCT oil to supplement uh, uh, for Alzheimer's patient and help with their brain function a little bit. Um, so we see that used. Um, the next one we talk about is melatonin. Uh, this is a natural remedy for sleep. Uh, it's very safe. Uh, so we should always start with melatonin for to use for sleep for, to help with our sleep. Uh, the over-the-counter sleep aid you see in the store is very bad for elderly people. Uh, it's similar to Benadryl, so it can cause a lot of confusion and ju impair judgment. And also in men, it can cause prostate problem or makes your bladder weak. And for men, we cannot pee if they have big and large prostate, and that's not good. Uh, next one is called red beet juice. Uh, red beet juice, sometimes you see that in salad. And the reason red beet is so good is kind of like the Viagra, natural Viagra. Uh, in, increase a blood, uh, the blood flow all, all over your body, including the brain. So it's kind of like ginkgo. Somebody, you know, people want to take ginkgo to improve their brain function. And ginkgo works by improving the blood flow. But it's not very effective compared to red beet juice. So I would recommend people drink one or two ounces of red beet juice a day, not too much. It's very sweet. Um, it can improve your blood flow all over. Um, and then I, we have attached the best practices from Alzheimer's Association. Uh, I want to show you some of the things. And these are for families and caregivers uh, on the common symptoms of uh, moderate to severe dementia. So if we can scroll down, you know, you know, they have strategies on how to help patients with sleep disturbance, uh, hallucinations, refusing care, constipation, um, all sorts of common things that family or caregiver encounters. Um, I think I, f I find this very useful uh, for families and patient caring for patients with my, my uh, moderate to severe dementia. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, now I'm open to answer questions, please.